I would like to give my views on the recent anti-hijab movement that has been taking place since the last 10 days in the state of Karnataka and India and it's spreading in different parts of India also where Muslim ladies are prevented from wearing the hijab and prevented from entering schools and colleges wearing the hijab and recently even the teachers are not allowed to wear the hijab in the schools and colleges mainly the government schools and many of the private schools and colleges they are prevented to wear the hijab and teach to the children and there are many questions that have come on this topic to me I'll just read three or four and though this calls for a full lecture of more than an hour but since there's a question answer session I'll try and touch on the important points in inshallah in few minutes I'll just read some of the selected questions there are many on this topic I'll just read three of them <coughs> the first question is Assalamu alaikum Dr. Zakir Naik Wa alaikum assalam This is Aisha Shireen a medical student from Tamil Nadu, India Currently, there is an issue going in Karnataka about Muslim students wearing hijab to schools and colleges. It is very painful to see such things happening around. How do you see it? What would you suggest us as a Muslim to do? How should a Muslim react to it as an individual? Is it necessary to protest? Since very few of us wear hijab in my college, I am afraid and confused what to do if this situation arises in Tamil Nadu. A similar question is also asked. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Zakir Naik. This is Imran from Bangalore, India. I wanted you to throw some light on the whole controversy happening on the hijab row in Karnataka, India. And also want to know how to protect our hijab rights even as government stroke private schools and colleges. Especially if they question us on the uniformity in the school or education institutions. Request you to kindly answer this question and help all the Muslims to understand how to protect our Islamic rights basically. Jazakallah khair. A similar question is again asked. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Aliza. I am from Pakistan. Can a Muslim non-hijabi wear hijab to stand in support or solidarity for hijabis? The fourth question that I've picked up is, Assalamu alaikum. Hope you are doing well. This is Rubina Fatima, engineer by profession. I live in Melbourne, Australia. Born and brought up in India. I want some notes about hijab. What is hijab and why hijab is important? References from Quran, quotes, numbers and also in other religious books. If it's there with quote, numbers and chapter references. Here in Australia, there is a protest for hijab on what's going on in India at present moment on 20th February 2022. So I am a speaker at this protest. Would like to speak about hijab from our Islamic perspective and also what's there about this in other religious books. Please help me with this. Jazakallah <coughs> khair. Basically the question I've asked that what should the Muslims do in such a situation where there is a hijab ban that has been proclaimed by the Karnataka government in colleges and schools that a Muslim lady cannot wear hijab and enter college in the school. Even the teachers are prevented from wearing hijab. So what should a Muslim do and how should we react? And the sister asked that, can I define hijab in brief and quote from Quran and from other scriptures regarding hijab. Regarding the reply to this controversy, Though many points what we Muslims should be aware that this government, the Modi government of India, they have an agenda. They are trying their level best see, to see to it that they marginalize the Muslims. This government is a fascist government. They have a Hindutva agenda and they're trying their level best to see to it that they subjugate and they persecute the Muslims of India. And we have to be prepared 
that this will happen. Now it is a situation of banning the hijab. Tomorrow they'll ban the Muslim men from wearing beard and so on and so forth. And they have an agenda and we know a couple of years back they came up with the citizen amendment bill which turned into a citizen amendment act. And I'll just overall give what a Muslim should do. And I've given a 17 point program and each Muslim should do what he can do the best for being a part of how to protect the rights of the Muslim. Number one, <clears throat> though this answer is about hijab, but it can be used for similar things also. Number one, that we Muslims should condemn the wrong that is being done. We Muslims, all of us, should condemn the anti-hijab movement that has been started by the Karnataka government and it will spread to other parts of India. It's already spreading. Number one, we have to condemn it with whatever ability we have. And today, social media is very common and almost all the Muslims have some or the other access, whether it be to the Facebook, whether it be to the Instagram, whether it be on the YouTube, whether it be on the Twitter, whether it be on the WhatsApp, whether it be on the SMS messages, we should see to it that we condemn this act to the best ability to as many people as we can and make an awareness also amongst the non-Muslims. And we should see to it that we acquire the knowledge. The question posed by the last sister that how can we describe about hijab, quote Quranic verses, as she wants to give a talk about other scriptures. This you will easily find in my talk on women's rights, on my lectures, on hijab and modesty, Islam, uh, women in Islam and other religions. I'll just mention here in brief that the two verses that are given in the Quran regarding hijab is from Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, where Allah says, Say to the believing woman that she should lower a gaze and guard her modesty, and display not the beauty except what appears ordinary of, and to draw her veil, a head covering over her bosom, except in front of her husband, her son, her husband's father, and a big list of meram, the close relatives which she can't marry is given. This is talking about the head covering that it's compulsory for the Muslim woman that she should cover her head and draw the head covering over her bosom and display not a beauty except what appears on of, except in front of the mehrams. And the next verse which speaks about hijab is Surah Azab chapter number 33 verse number 59 which says that, O Prophet, tell your wives, your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad they should put on the jilbab, the overcoat, so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. So here the Quran says that the overcoat is required for the Muslim when they go abroad so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. So hijab, the reason is given in the Quran, as Allah says, prevent them from being molested, from being teased, etc. These two are the major verses in the Quran talking about the hijab. There are various hadith you can refer to, to my lecture on women's rights. And as far as hijab is concerned, there are basically six criteria for hijab. The first is the extent which differs between the male and the woman. For the male, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. There are some scholars who say that even the face should be covered. So the extent is the one which differs between the man and the woman. The remaining five criteria are the same. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be tight fitting so that it reveals the figure. Number three, it should not be tight fitting to reveal the figure. Number three, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through. Number four, it should not be glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Number five, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And number six, it should not resemble that of the other religions besides Islam. These are basically the six criteria of hijab, which mainly talks about the clothes, but hijab in total, besides the clothing, it also refers to how a person walks, how a person talks, how a person thinks, and it's in detail. This was in a nutshell, as far as hijab is concerned, and the quotation in the Quran. Hijab is also mentioned in the major religions, in the scriptures of the other major religions. 
Hijab is also mentioned in Christianity. If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 22, verse number 5. It says that the men should not wear clothes that would pertinent to a woman. And a woman should not wear clothes that would pertinent to a man. All those who do, they are an abomination to the Lord. It further mentioned in the first Timothy, chapter number 2, verse number 9, that the woman should be dressed up with sobriety, with sobriety and with shamefacedness. And they should not wear costly array of braided hair of gold or pearl. It further mentioned in the first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 and 6, that the woman that prayeth with her head uncovered, her head should be shown off. That means the Bible says <coughs> that a woman who prays with the head uncovered, she dishonors her head and her hair should be shaved off. There is no verse in the Quran or the Hadith that I know where it says that the woman's head should be shaved off. But the Bible is more stricter than the Quran or the Hadith as far as hijab is concerned. This was, in a nutshell, as far as Christianity is concerned. There are various verses, even in Hindu scriptures, we talk about hijab. If you read the Mahacharitra, uh, Act number 2, page number 71, where Sri Ram, he says to his wife, Sita, that Parusram, our elder, is coming, so you lower your gaze and you draw the veil. It's further mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 33, verse number 19. It says that Brahma has made you a dame, so lower your gaze, look at your feet and do not reveal what your veil conceals. It's also mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 85 verse number 30, that a husband should not wear clothes of the wife. And there are various verses, you can refer to my lecture on similarities between Islam and Hinduism, also a similarity between Islam and Christianity, where I've spoken about modesty. This was in a nutshell, regarding the question of the last sister, that she wants some points. But for more details, you can refer to my video cassettes and my books on this topic, or you can go on the al Hidayah platform and you can go through the course on similarities between Islam and Hinduism and the other talks on comparative religion. <coughs> so point number one, as I mentioned, that there should be protest, there should be condemnation. Point number one, there should be condemnation by whatever way you can on the social media to, to whichever people you can regarding the anti-hijab movement. Number two, you should acquire knowledge and see to it that you spread this knowledge of the deen, about hijab, that hijab is there in the other religion and spread as much as you can, whether in the form of booklets, whether you go to a website and take the answer and forward it to your friends, etc. Point number three, that see to it that you make an awareness. You can have plays on the streets. You can have posters and billboards talking about hijab, about the rights of the Muslim woman. You can have information put on, on buses on trains, on rickshaws, whatever you can, you should do maximum. Point number four, if you have contact with the media, whether you can write articles in the newspapers or in magazines, or if you have contact with the television stations, see to it you have programs, awareness of this and talking about the rights. And in all the secular countries, and India is a democratic country, it's a secular country. It is enshrined in a constitution that every citizen of India has the right to preach, propagate and practice his or her religion. And it is a fundamental right of every citizen of India that they can practice their religion. And we should make it a point that hijab is the fard for every Muslim woman. And it is our right and no one can take away this right from us. So this awareness should be made as much as possible whether with street plays, whether on the media, whether on the television, as much as you can. Point number five, that there should be a protest. There should be a peaceful protest. There should be a large gathering and making it a point that what the Karnataka government has done is totally against the constitution and we are against it. And protests have a great impact. And recently, as you may be aware, that the protest done by the farmers, it was a protest that was there for 
one year, four months and two days. There were three laws passed against the farmers, three farm bills in the parliament. And there was a protest done by farmers of India, mainly from, from the state of Punjab. And they came and they, and they did a protest in the city of India, uh, in the capital city of India, in Delhi. And they did a protest. It was for one year, four months and two days, from the 9th of August 2020 till the 11th of December 2020-21. And there were hundreds of thousands of people all over India, mainly in the city of, of Delhi, and they protested. So much so that the government was forced to take back the three laws they passed and they reversed it. It was a very successful protest and they were firm on it. And we know that these protests, if it's done unanimously, with unity, it has a great impact. So what the Muslims should do is that the Muslims, they should be united. The point to be noted is that Muslims should be united, we should keep away our differences. And in such situation where it talks about the Sharia, we should see to it that we should be united and we protest unanimously throughout India. And according to the government, the Muslims are more than 4.5 percent. We are more than 200 million, but the actual figures are much more than 250 million. Imagine, even if half of the Muslim protest, and from this half, half is more than 100 million, and from this half maybe those who are children and elders and those who are sick, if you remove half of them, yet there will be more than 50 million. Imagine if all of us take out a peaceful protest throughout India, the government will have to change. Imagine these farmers, the government said there were hardly 40,000, but according to me there were more than 100,000 or maybe a couple of 100,000 and the protest was successful, they were firm. So we should see to it that we have a peaceful protest and see to it that we fight for our rights and we Muslims unitedly oppose this unjust this injustice that has been done about the ban, the hijab ban that has started in Karnataka and is spreading in different parts of India. The seventh is that we should file a case in the court, in the high court or if required later on in the Supreme Court to fight for our rights and hire the best of lawyers. I know this has been done, but we should see to it that we hire the best of lawyers and we supply them with material talking about the hijab in Islam as well as hijab in other religions. And we know today in India, if you see the old coins of India, there are coins on which there were women that were veiled. Even today, in many of the Hindu villages, the women, they, they cover themselves, they cover the complete head so much so that the veil comes to their shoulders that this thing should be highlighted, that this is the right of a citizen of India to practice what they feel is there and they cannot object to it. This is the sixth point about having good lawyers. We should have an organization of Muslim lawyers to see to it that when, when such issues come up, they should be prepared very well and file a case immediately and take the help of even other non-Muslim lawyers to prove our point and fight for our rights. <clears throat> Number seven is that we, we Muslims should have an organization which is specialized in taking care of such issues. That whenever this injustice done to Muslims, how we have Dawa organizations, we have other organizations, we should have specialized organization that take care of issues, especially when there is any issue which is against the rights of the Muslim, against the Sharia. These organizations should be active and we should see to it that we are able to get into action immediately. And we Muslims should see to it that we support such organization with whatever ability we can, 
whether it be knowledge, whether it be time, whether it's with money, we Muslims should contribute to such organization so that they can fight for the rights of the Muslim to the best level possible. Number eight is that we Muslims should also be politically strong. Unfortunately, we Muslims in India are very weak politically, though we are more than 14% according to Indian statistics, according to me we are more than 20%, we can be a great vote bank, but unfortunately our votes are divided. We have, you know, some Muslims supporting party A, some Muslims supporting party B, some Muslims uh, uh, supporting party C, and when we stand for election, we, our votes are divided, so our net effect is as good as zero. And there are occasions where in Muslim majority place, we have got maybe about five Muslims standing from five different parties and one party which is anti-Islamic also stands, all the Muslim votes are divided, though it's a Muslim majority area, and that anti-Islamic party easily wins the election because we're divided. What we should do is that we should be politically aware. Number one, if we can have a national Muslim party which takes away our differences and a party only which is by Muslims. Unless we have a total Muslim party and this Muslim party can collaborate with other non-Muslim party depending upon whether they agree with the Islamic rights or not. But if we have an individual party and we unanimously support only that Muslim party, then only we'll be successful. Unfortunately, in India, the Muslims are divided in most of the aspects, including politically. Politically, we have no say because we Muslims are divided into various different parties and each Muslim politician tries to satisfy his own needs, satisfied so that he gets his own seat. He's not really bothered about the rights of the Muslim or whether the Muslims get their haq or not. So politically we should be strong, besides having a Muslim party, there should be intellectual groups that we decide that which non-Muslim party should we support for this election which has a chance of winning so that that non-Muslim party will give the rights of the Muslim. Unless we don't do this, we will never be able to voice our opinion. So politically we should be united. That is point number eight. Point number nine, since this issue is of educational institutions where they are prevented and they are giving silly excuses like we believe in uniformity and we don't want nuance. They are not, though they are actually against Islam, they are against Muslim and hijab has become a symbol of Islam. It hurts them that this Muslim woman, mashallah, she protects the modesty and they they are hurt that the Muslims are strictly adhering to the principle of Islam. Have you ever heard that, a, that an Indian institution has prevented a Sikh from entering the premises saying that you should remove your turban or you should remove your beard? beard. You'll never see that because the Sikhs, they, though they are a minority, they are less than 3% in India, yet they are strong, they are united. Unfortunately, Muslims are divided. So, we should be united. And the ninth point is that we should have our own educational institutions. We should make our own Muslim managed schools, Muslim managed college, colleges, Muslim managed university, so that we aren't dependent on the government or the non Muslim for education. We have, but the numbers are very less. We should have multiple times more number of Muslim managed schools in which Muslims are allowed to practice their, their religion, whether it be hijab, whether it be salah, whether men keeping their beard. And we should have more number of colleges, more number of universities. We have few examples like Aligarh Muslim University, we have the Jamia Mila, uh, uh, Jamia Milia in, in Delhi. We have the example of Anjuman Islam, mashallah, it's a large, large Muslim educational organization which has got umpteen number of schools and colleges 
in different parts of Maharashtra, mainly in Bombay. We should have more such organizations. We should have more such Muslim educational institutions, more such Islamic universities. Unless we don't have this, we will not be able to practice our deen openly. So this point is very important that Muslims now, this should be a catalyst for Muslims to start more number of Islamic or Muslim managed schools, colleges, also universities, so that we can be independent. Now these nine points are mainly about Muslims living in India. We'll come to the other part, what the Muslims can do outside India. The tenth point is that the Muslims that are living outside India should also protest in their country in front of the Indian High Commission, in whichever country they are living. They may be living in, in countries that Muslims are minority, maybe USA, maybe UK, maybe Australia. We have to protest. And mainly in the Muslim majority countries. We should see to it that we protest about against the unjust anti-hijab movement that has started in Karnataka. And see to it that we protest a peaceful protest in front of the Indian High Commission in different parts of the world and give a letter of protest to the ambassador of India in their country. Number 11, the Muslim majority country on a government level, they should see to it that the Muslim majority country in their country, they call the ambassador of India. They call the high commissioner of India and see to it that the, the foreign minister of that Indian majority country, he gives a protest letter to the ambassador or the high commissioner of India condemning this act and protesting against the unjust ban on hijab on the Muslim woman. This is the 11th point. Twelfth, on a higher level, the Muslim countries, if yet India does not stop with, with the persecution of the Muslims, they should cut the trade with India. And we know that a few months back, there was a, a conference held in Haridwar by the Hindutva organizations and there they said that the Hindus should not deal with Muslims, we should not buy goods from the Muslims, we should not see to it that we don't give our houses on rent to the Muslims, we should not let them study in our institution and they gave a list of things how the Muslims should be persecuted. If this is the agenda that, that we should not buy from the Muslims, we should not sell our goods to the Muslims, so why don't they extend it throughout the world? Do you know that India has trade with many Muslim countries? Amongst, amongst the 19 top countries which India trades with, do you know 10 of them are Muslims? 50% of the top 19 countries that India trades with, more than 50% are Muslim countries. Do you know that? And among the things that the Muslim countries are known for and which supply India is the petrol, it is the natural gas, it is the palm oil and all this is a requirement. The palm oil, 90% of the exported palm oil are by Muslim countries in Indonesia and Malaysia. And India is the biggest consumer of palm oil. If this Haridwar movement is saying that we should not buy from Muslims, that we should not sell to Muslims, and why don't they extend it throughout the world? It would be difficult for the Indian government to survive. They, have, they require petrol, they require natural gas, they require palm oil, and there are other things. There are many other things. So, in fact, we Muslims, if we are united internationally, 
and politically we will be a strong force and we can surely see to it that the injustice that is done against the Muslims in different parts of, of the world, it will be stopped. It is the duty of the Muslims toward the world. What we have to do is that we can advise. Unfortunately, the Muslims internationally are very weak. If we put a trade ban against those countries which are against Islam, we will be a strong force. We should be united. Even if the five or ten major Muslim countries get together, you know, the countries in the Gulf, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, they are known. If all of them get together, Turkey, Pakistan, and the Gulf countries, we get together, we will be a strong force. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we Muslims are united on this aspect. The 13th point is that if, if yet that country which is against Islam is continuing with its atrocities, what do we do? We cut all diplomatic relationships. And the best example is what Muslim country did with Israel. Majority of the Muslim country, they have severed their diplomatic relationship with Israel. Unfortunately, some Muslim countries have started again. If we cut the diplomatic relationship completely and see to it that we stop all activity and all the Muslims do unitedly, we will be a strong force. If we do this, this would be very effective. This is point number 13. Point number 14 is that how there is a UNO, United Nations Organization, there should be an MNO, Muslim, <laughs> Muslim Organization, United Muslim Organization. That is UMO. United Muslim Organization, where all the Muslims country join together and make an organization that if any issue is against the Muslims in any part of the world, we should be united. There are some organizations like OIC, etc., but they are very weak. We should see to it that this organization should not be based on individual countries or individual people for their personal benefit. It should be an organization where Muslims gather together only on the basis of Quran and Sunnah, only on the basis of the Sharia. And if, the, if all the Muslims countries get together and the main countries see to it that they have such an organization and we see it and if we are united and if we stand united and we give a strong message, inshallah, inshallah, we will be very successful. We should see to it that the Muslims should think of a united Muslim organization. It should be much powerful even than the UNO. Then only will we be successful. And the next point, that is the 15th point, is that we should have how there is a WTO, World Trade Organization, there should be a Muslim trade organization where all the Muslim countries get together and they trade together so that we will be a much powerful force unitedly. So if you want to fix a price for petrol, we see to it that we collaborate and we communicate with each other and put a fixed price. If you have to send palm oil, see to it that the Muslim countries collaborate and see to it its benefit for both. So if we have a Muslim trade organization, where all the Muslim countries get together and we trade under one banner will be much more effective. Point number 16, how there is an Interpol, international police, we should have an Islam pole, Islamic police. Today we find that wherever they want, they see to it that they persecute the Muslims internationally, we should have our own Islamic police. So that we set the rules and conditions, what is right and what is wrong. And the last and the 17th point, which is the most important and which will surely happen, is that unless we don't go back to the original, in Islam we know that our beloved Prophet Muhammad and Islam believes in a Khilafa. Unfortunately, this Khilafa was abolished approximately about 100 years back in 1923. 
and the last Khilafa was in Turkey at the time of Ottoman Empire and from that time we have become weak. Inshallah, Inshallah, whether you want it or not, the Khilafa is going to be reinstated, whether you like it or not. And Allah has promised, Allah has promised in the Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, Allah says that, Huwa ladhi arsal rasulhu bilhuda. That Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Socialism, Atheism, Islam is destined to supersede all, Kulli master them all. And Allah says in two places in the Quran that how much the mushrik don't like it and one place Allah says and enough is Allah as a witness three places Allah repeats this message that that Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions over all the other isms how much the Mushri don't like it. However much the pagans, the idol worshippers don't like it. And enough is Allah as a witness. And we know from the Sahih Hadith that inshallah, inshallah, there are signs, minor signs of the end of the world and the major signs. And many of the minor signs, more than 50% have already come. Allah wa alam, when will the world end? But before that, surely the Khilafat would be reinstated. And the last Khalifa, as the Sayyid Hadith says, will rule for seven years and this would be the best age for, for the humankind. And even non-Muslims, they will have their due rights. And it will be a fantastic time where Muslims will rule the world for seven years. With, whether you like it or you don't like it, whether I like it or not. This has been mentioned in the Hadith. And later on after that, there will be a sweet wind that will come and all the believers will die. And then would the day of judgment come. And you can go to my Facebook and I've given the signs, the minor signs of the end of the world and the major signs, the minor signs. I think it's uh, more than 87 that I've enumerated, depending upon how you label it. And there are 10 major signs. So this was the 17 point. We Muslims, whatever we can do, to the best of ability, we should do as much as we can. Whether it has an impact or not, Allah is testing us. That when the enemies of Islam, when they attack Islam, what do we do? We have to do to the best of ability, whatever we can amongst these 17 points. And the rest we leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, we have to pray. And, uh, and we pray for our brothers and sisters in India. And we pray that may they be secured and may Allah grant them safety from the fascist BJP government and from the Prime Minister. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there are Muslim countries which invite the Prime Minister of India and Narendra Modi and they give them the highest award of the country. How can a Muslim leader of a Muslim country do this? What will he answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment? Openly when this Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, when he is persecuting the Muslims in different ways, every few months he is coming up with a new agenda. These are all planned. How can he be called to a Muslim majority country and a Muslim leader, whether it be a Prime Minister or a President or a Sheikh or a King, how can he welcome such a fascist? What will they answer on the Day of Judgment? We Muslims should be united and we have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that inshallah, inshallah, this religion of deen, it will prevail over all the other religions. Hope this answers in a nutshell and I tried to cover as many points from the question that were asked and repeat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he secure our Muslims brothers and sisters in India. Jazakallah khair.